So one of the most fascinating questions in biology is how the human brain works. How is it put together in a way that we can move and think and feel emotion? And actually, one of my uh, early neuroscience professors posed the question, can our brains understand our brains? Something to think about. Equally fascinating is the question of how small mistakes that are made during formation of the brain can lead to dysfunction and intellectual disability, as happens in developmental disorders. So human brain development, our brains develop, our, the formation of the brain happens primarily prenatally. All the billions of cells that need to be there get put together in the way they need to. And most of the neurons, or the functional cells in the brain, um, are born and move to where they need to about mid-gestation. And so that when we're born, our brains are fairly well formed, and they're ready to accept the stimulus that happens in the outside world to be able to form the correct connections to, for, to allow us to function as um, functional organisms. So because this happens prenatally, um, it's been very difficult for us to understand the, the many steps that occur in order to form a fully functional brain. And also, when something goes wrong, it's hard to be able to identify the problems that go wrong. So the challenge is, how do we study early brain development and mistakes that happen in developmental disorders when it happens in, uh, prenatally? So today I want to talk to you about one potential solution, which is to use stem cells to study brain development. So uh, stem cells, human embryonic stem cells, are those stem cells that are found in the embryo. Um, and they're there about a week after fertilization, so very, very early in uh, the development of um, an organism. The job of these stem cells is to grow and divide and to eventually turn into all the 250 different cell types in our body and to do that in a very organized way, again, so that we um, end up being fully functional human beings. So, um, a really rev revelation that happened about 15, 20 years ago right here on the UW campus was that Jamie Thompson uh, figured out how to isolate these cells and put them in a culture dish. And when, he, when we do that, uh, these cells continue to grow. And in addition, they um, can turn into all the different cell types of the body, but in a culture dish. And so this allows us a window into the early steps that happen as a stem cell turns into a different cell type. Okay? So for example, we can use these cells, as I'm going to tell you, to study how brain cells develop. And, how, and then we'll end up with fully functional brain cells. So more recently, about five years ago, something happened that to scientists like me was science fiction. And that is that stem cell researchers figured out a way to basically turn back the developmental clock. So they figured out that you can take one of these fully developed cells and you can turn them back into a stem cell. And this is done by giving them specific factors or spe uh, and um, making them express specific stem cell genes so that they then uh, basically turn back the clock and then they turn into a cell type that has all the characteristics of a human embryonic stem cell. But you didn't have to use an embryo to get there. You were able to use a skin cell. These cells are called reprogrammed stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells. Today I'll refer to them as iPS cells, induced pluripotent stem cells. So as I said, this was really remarkable in the field of developmental biology that we could turn back the clock on development. Um, that's not something we ever thought we could do. Um, but in addition to that, it provided us with this amazing opportunity to now be able to study different genetic disorders and even normal development. And I'll talk to you about that. So if we can take a skin cell and turn it into a stem cell, that means we can get skin cells from everybody. So what we can do is take a skin biopsy from a person, either a, a healthy person or a person who has a genetic disease. We can take those skin cells, put them in a dish, and then reprogram them into induced pluripotent stem cells, and then take those stem cells and, and differentiate them or let them develop into any cell type that we are interested in, and in, in make the connection between the cell type that's affected in that disease and the person. 
So in our case, we're interested in brain cells. So we can take those stem cells that came from a person's skin cells and turn them into brain cells to understand how they, how they work. So the example I'm going to show you today is about Down syndrome, where we were able to get skin cells from individuals with Down syndrome. So most of you are familiar with Down syndrome. Many of you probably know individuals with Down syndrome. Uh, Down syndrome is the most common genetic form of intellectual disability. And it um, is characterized by mild to moderate intellectual disability. And in addition, individuals with Down syndrome are at a very high risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. How does that happen? We'd like to know more about that. Down syndrome is caused by a whole extra chromosome. So we all have um, uh, two pair, uh, a pair of 23 chromosomes. So we have 46 chromosomes. People with Down syndrome have an extra chromosome, chromosome 21. And even though this is the smallest human chromosome, it still has on it about 300 genes. So it's, it's a quite complex disorder. So we wanted to understand how uh, um, the brain development in individuals with Down syndrome might be different from, from everyone else. And so we took skin cells from individuals with Down syndrome via skin, uh, skin biopsy, reprogrammed them to stem cells, and then took those stem cells and turned them into neurons to be able to make Down syndrome neurons. <clears throat> and we have done this, and we've made neurons in the dish, um, as shown here in, they're outlined in green, control and Down syndrome, from control from um, people that don't have Down syndrome. And when we first looked at them, we thought they looked really similar. And that makes sense, because individuals with Down syndrome have a lot that goes right in their brains. And so we would expect that the differences that we see may be small. So we looked more carefully at these, at these Down syndrome neurons, and we found specific things were going wrong. One is they have less synaptic activity. So these neurons are electrically active, and that's how they communicate with other neurons in the brain, and that's how these connections are formed, and that's how uh, the brain functions. So when we looked at the Down syndrome neurons, we found they had less of this synaptic activity. They, had, they were making less, they had less, they were talking to each other less. And um, I hope you can see here that compared to the controls, they have about half as much um, activity. They were quieter. And this may explain why they maybe don't work as well as they do in individuals without Down syndrome. So we asked whether the reason they don't talk to each other as well is maybe because they don't have as many connections, as many synapses. And so we looked carefully at the synapses or the connections between neurons that were found on Down syndrome neurons. And I'm not sure if you can see this, but along these red neurons, we looked for green synapses. We colored them that way. They're not normally like that in the brain. And we counted how many connections are on the Down syndrome neurons compared to the controls. And we found there were about half as many. And so this can explain why these neurons might not function the same way that they do uh, without Down syndrome, and uh, may, uh, may explain why the, the talking to each other is much quieter. So you may say, well, this is, these are cells in a culture dish. What does this have to do with what actually happens in the brain? And we're just looking at some of the neurons, and we don't have a fully functional three-dimensional brain. How does this relate to what actually is going on in the brain? Well, it turns out that in some of the limited post-mortem studies on uh, Down syndrome brain, we have been able to look at the neurons when they're in the brain, and we've been able to show that there are uh, the connections or these synapses between the neurons are really different in the Down syndrome brain. And so in this picture, on the left, there are a control neuron with its synapses, these spines that are coming out of the neuron that are the synaptic connections in the brain. And then on the right, you can see the Down syndrome synaptic connections on these neurons are less, and they're smaller. So we really feel like what we have shown in a culture dish relates to what happens in the brain and provides us with the beginnings of understanding what might be going wrong in a developmental disorder like Down syndrome. So I've talked to you about Down syndrome, 
But this strategy can be used to study many different developmental disorders and actually any genetic disease. So we can use this uh, strategy to study genetic disorders like Down syndrome or um, genetic um, mutations that cause autism, for example. There are a lot of other genetic mutations that cause developmental disorders that are outside of the brain. This strategy can also be used to study environmental factors that contribute to developmental disorders. Because we have these cells in a dish, we can theoretically treat them with environmental factors that we know may impact their development. So a good example of that would be fetal alcohol syndrome, where um, when um, the fetus is exposed to alcohol during development, it does lead to some um, dysfunction in, in the brain. Because we get these cells, the skin cells, from people who, have, who already have the characteristics of some sort of disease or disorder, we can also use this strategy to study disorders that we don't know the cause of. We can uh, put the cells from um, an individual who has a specific disorder, but we don't know what hap how that happened, and study the cells to try and find out what might be different and, how and eventually lead to what might be causing those differences. So a good example of this would be autism. We don't really know how autism occurs, but we can take skin cells from many individuals with autism, put them in a dish, and see what's different from um, unaffected people, and also find out if they all act the same. It may be that autism is, uh, there are different subsets of autism. Some have one characteristic, some have another. And we can um, try and get a handle on that by putting these cells into the culture dish. So finally, what do, how does this matter? Um, what, how can this help? Uh, we're talking about uh, cells in a dish and how they function, and I've shown you that while we know that many of the characteristics that we see in the culture dish mimic what we know happens in the brain, how can that really help us move forward? Well, I think the first way is that by pinpointing the specific deficits that happen in uh, brain development in these developmental disorders, it can more help us more intelligently design therapies. Those therapies could be drugs, or they could be behavioral therapies. If one population of, of neurons in the brain is not working right, then perhaps we can design behavioral therapy to not to uh, work around that, that population of cells. Use a different cell. Use a different strategy for learning that may not rely on that population of cells. And of course, for drug uh, therapies, it's possible then if we know when and where a problem may be occurring, we can target potentially a compound or a drug that may change that or normalize that process. The other way that this information that we get from these neurons in culture that come from stem cells is to provide a bridge between animal models and human clinical trials for drug testing or drug development. So most of the drugs that are on the market now that we all take uh, were tested in animal models. And then after they have been shown to be uh, efficient in animal models that they're then put into human clinical trials. And that's a big gap, going from an animal, often a rodent, into um, a human person. And so these cells provide a way to have human cells in the culture dish that you can at least test some things on, um, on some drugs, on different, some processes before you move to people. So for example, it might be that you have a drug that works fabulously in an animal. And you put it into people, and it's very toxic. It has some un, unknown effect or an unanticipated effect in people um, that it didn't have in animals. And so instead of um, having people be the guinea pigs for this toxicity, you could potentially have human cells in culture to test that toxicity. So what I've told you about today is a, a way we can study really early events in, in our own brain development, not in animals, but our own human brain development, by using stem cells. And by using stem cells that were obtained from skin cells. And as I pointed out, this was really science fiction even five years ago. And so it is really exciting to imagine what might happen in another five years, or even 20 years, 
where then will the science lead us?